Welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, just a quick introduction uh, about myself. So I am uh, an assistant professor of psychology uh, at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, where I research collective intelligence. Um, and I am also uh, the co-founder of Sci, uh, which is a voice platform uh, that uses collective intelligence principles uh, to improve decision making in uh, large groups. Uh, and you will all have uh, you know, a chance to use it uh, later today uh, during our uh, capstone session. Uh, but for now, you know, for this 20 minutes, uh, I will give you uh, a brief introduction uh, of what is collective intelligence um, and what are uh, its most important principles. Now, the title uh, for this seminar is uh, a brief introduction to collective intelligence. Um, but, uh, you know, we could easily rename it as learn about animals with Sai, uh, because uh, nature uh, provides the best examples of collective intelligence. Uh, and so this presentation's learning objective uh, is really to learn about the principles required uh, for collective intelligence to improve uh, group decision making. Uh, and knowing these benefits, um, you know, benefits you as practitioners of community engagement because you will be able uh, to design um, public engagement that is, uh, you know, less biased uh, and more robust to something like, you know, herding, uh, groupthink, uh, and misinformation. So after reviewing uh, some of the examples of collective intelligence that we find in nature, you will have uh, kind of a bird's eye view uh, of uh, this very interesting field. Uh, and this is an interactive session. So please, when I uh, ask you a question, uh, unmute your mic and answer. Uh, I won't be able to look at the chat, so please don't use that. Um, and uh, if everybody is ready, we can start. Okay, so what animal is this? I'll go with cow. Very good, it's a cow. So it's uh, almost customary uh, to start a workshop on collective intelligence with a cattle example. Now, <laughs> a more difficult question is how heavy is this cow? And again, please unmute yourself, give me a number um, and please specify the units. You know, we don't want to uh, confuse people with metric or imperial as some people are here in Europe. One ton. One ton. Anybody else? Go ahead. I'd say a thousand. A thousand what? Pounds. A thousand pounds. I'll go with 500 pounds. 500 pounds? 1,200. 1,200? Okay. Anybody else? All right, so we have like a sort of good distribution of, of estimates. Now, some of you have probably heard of the term uh, wisdom of crowds. So what is it? Now, if I take all these answers and compare the average uh, with the actual weight of this cow, now the average of your answers will be very, very close to the true weight uh, of this cow. This is it. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have the true weight of this cow because you know it's a picture that I took from Google. But the first uh, wisdom of crowd experiment was uh, done with a real cow in 1907 uh, by Sir Francis Galton, who was uh, Charles Darwin's uh, controversial cousin. Now, the wisdom of crowds is um, a statistical effect. So when you average independent estimates, noise tend to average out, while the signal, so the true weight of this cow, stays constant uh, across people. Uh, which means that you know, some people tend to overestimate, some people underestimate, but on average, you know, these errors cancel each other out. But the crucial thing is that for the wisdom of crowds to happen, judgments need to stay independent from each other. Now, in our sort of little demonstration here, the first person answering uh, probably kind of influenced uh, all the others that followed, right? And the problem is that it is very difficult to find independent judgments in the real world. 
Now, why? Because we are social creatures, right? So we interact with each other, we read the same news, uh, we are influenced by um, you know, what our friends say or our family says. Um, and we even try to actively influence each other. And you know, this is good to some extent. Uh, social interaction is uh, at the heart of community living, of politics, of governance. Now, this is our um, first two collective intelligence principles. So first, there is value in independence. So this means uh, that for collective intelligence to work, people should think with their own heads. And if they don't, you know, you get groupthink, herding, and other group biases that we know. Uh, and the wisdom of crowds, uh, you know, can turn into what researchers call uh, the madness of crowds. Now, look at this picture for a second. Uh, and this is kind of a size reinterpretation of uh, a great Iranian illustrator, Mana uh, Neyestani. So what do you think is happening in this picture? Everybody well, mute? It's discussing artwork, um, but <laughs> hard to interpret beyond that. Mm -hmm. Two people discussing artwork, anybody else? Maybe how the art is made by pieces or or drops of paint that are in a circle that show the circle on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a square world and there's a circle creating uh, some discontinuity. Some what, sorry? Discontinuity. Continuity, okay. Love it. Anybody else that wants to try an interpretation? I was going to say color theory. Mm, okay. What do you mean? Um, so all the squares are made up of different colors from what the circle actually is. Mm -hmm. so discussing the maybe color theory of what it could be. Very good. Okay. Um, anybody else? All right. So thank you for like, yeah, these brilliant interpretations, like very different. Um, now, in this picture, this is like how I read it. Square people only understand square ideas, right? This is like the bubble here, like with all the square um, little sticky notes. Uh, but by talking to each other, they can form, uh, you know, new perspectives and like view of the world, which is like, you know, the art in this case. Um, for basically what it really is, which is a circle. And I think, you know, it perfectly captures this idea that, you know, while independence is important, there is also value in social interactions because, you know, we can learn from other people. We can adopt a new perspective or come up with a new idea. And so principles, you know, one and two seem in contradiction, right? How can we stay independent and learn from other people? You know, that seems impossible. Uh, and a lot of work that is done in this field tries to find an answer to this question. Um, and so for the rest of the seminar, we will try to understand how to answer that too. Um, so we spoke about independence uh, and social interaction, and now we are going to dive into social interaction. And uh, we are going to talk about local interactions versus global interactions. So let's shift gears and look at two examples at the micro scale. So what animal is this? A flea. A flea, perfect. The, the, the correct answer at the first try, great. What animal is this? COVID. COVID, yes, our beloved coronavirus. Uh, so of course, you know, with a stretch of the imagination, we can call this an animal, you know, even if it is not properly an animal. Uh, so why did I pick these two quote unquote animals? Um, because they are related to two completely different contagion patterns. Uh, and I'm going to talk about contagion patterns because um, when you think about community engagement uh, and group decision-making, uh, it can help us understand how ideas spread. Now, the flea was um, the first vector of contagion of an even like smaller 
animal, uh, which is a bacterium called Yersinia pestis uh, that caused the plague in uh, the 14th uh, century. Uh, and this is how the, um, the plague spread through Europe in the 14th century. Uh, so it came from the east, spread throughout the Mediterranean, and then like moved uh, to Eastern Europe and then uh, up uh, to the north um, of Scandinavian countries. Uh, and you can see that this is kind of like a wave-like pattern, right? Uh, probably it was brought from village to village uh, by caravans or by people uh, that were moving on foot. So entirely from local interactions. Now compare this uh, with COVID that in just a few months was everywhere. Uh, radically different spreading patterns uh, because COVID did not travel on foot, but uh, by plane. And this image uh, shows the global network uh, of air travels. Uh, COVID was much quicker at spreading and way more difficult to contain because it moved on a network. So rather than local interactions, now these global interactions become more consequential. Now, why am I talking about COVID? Uh, and you know, what does uh, this have to do with you know, democratic institutions? Well, the thing is that similar networks behave similarly, no matter what travels on that network. Uh, for example, this is a Facebook social network from a few years back. Um, different type of network, but you know, very similar characteristics. Again, these like global range connections. Uh, and social media and Facebook in particular uh, is where a lot of people uh, read their news, talk to each other and uh, form political opinions. And this is just to show you that today, both viruses and information travel on densely connected networks. Uh, and this paper uh, from a colleague of mine makes the point that networks are really good at spreading things. Uh, this can be you know, funny memes, uh, news, uh, vaccines, but it can also mean misinformation, fake news and viruses. Uh, and you reach a point where by increasing the connections in a network, you also increase uh, its fragility because now you create too many dependencies, which is you know, the opposite of independence that we saw uh, was so important um, at the beginning. Um, and, but if you remember like the second principle, right? We, we also saw that too much independence is also bad because now information doesn't travel at all. Okay, now uh, let's go for the last two animals. Uh, and the last couple of slides, you know, will show the benefits of local interactions across an organization or uh, a large group uh, of individuals. Now, what animals are these? Starlings. Wow. Anybody else? Maybe a different, different suggestion? Locusts. Locusts, okay. Anyone else? Bats. Bats, okay. Who wants to try a last attempt? Now that they are close. Yeah, you really can't see exactly. They just like look like dots. Uh, but they are starlings. So uh, you probably, I, I give it away like with my uh, uh, reaction. It was like the first time that somebody like got it at the first, uh, on, on the first time. Uh, yes, it's, so it's a flock of starlings. Um, and this beautiful pattern uh, emerges entirely from uh, local interactions. Uh, so this means that no starling in the flock has any idea of uh, what's happening more than a few meters away. So it's not a COVID-like pattern, but it's more like a plague-like pattern. Um, and yet these types of collective behavior are not entirely chaotic, right? You see these patterns emerging. Uh, the flock stays together uh, and it can also show 
very useful uh, collective properties. For example, uh, for example, avoiding predators. So what animal are these? Seals. Sea lions. Sea lions. Anyone else? I mean, interested herring? in the herring. The herring. Herring. Anybody else? We have a marine biologist in the in the room. No, no other suggestions. So these are sardines and seals. Um, and again, you know, most sardines uh, in this school do not know that the school is being hunted. Um, you know, they react only to other local sardines movement um, to avoid collision, basically. Um, and yet, when one sardine tries to avoid uh, a predator, that information, that movement quickly spreads through uh, the school. Uh, and so these are our last two principles. Um, so keep interactions local. This means that everyone uh, should be able to learn from and influence at least someone in their group uh, because local interactions allow the group to uh, exchange ideas while preserving sort of some level uh, of independence. Uh, and compare these, for example, with groups where someone can influence everyone in the group. Uh, perhaps because they are you know, more influential, influential leaders, or they are the boss. Um, people with a megaphone can sway the entire group, both uh, toward a good decision, but also towards a bad decision. Uh, and you know, leaders are great uh, to mobilize groups, but they can also hinder organizations if they falter. So once you understand these principles of collective intelligence, you will start uh, to understand how collective intelligence can help you design uh, better community engagement. Uh, you will be able to apply these principles to your practice in your organization, uh, in, as well as to politics, to governance, um, to everything you do. Um, and you will be able to recognize uh, who in the communities that you engage with has more influence than other people, uh, when their greater influence is justified, or when, you know, instead, like a more participatory approach to decision making is needed. Uh, and recognizing these things can help you design better community engagement uh, and reduce the impact of groupthink, uh, as well as spreading uh, of misinformation.